Today we rejoin Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, <clears throat> where they will be camped for the rest of Exodus. Um, we turn to Exodus 20 today, where we're going to get the renowned Ten Commandments. Where we are in the story, uh, the people have recently been released from slavery and the slavery to the powerful and cruel Pharaoh of Egypt, and they have just sworn allegiance voluntarily to a new master, to a powerful and kind master, to Yahweh, their deliverer. It impressed me last week as we studied chapter 19 that the people, they come to Sinai, and when they get there, they say something shocking, at least shocking to me. Well, it's, first of all, it's shocking because pretty much everything we've heard from them so far has just been complaining. But here, before they hear even one thing that God will require of them, they all say in unison something very similar to what we say when we are done living for ourselves and we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. They say this, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They vow to obey whatever God puts on the table. This is the original blank check. Now, this impresses me a lot. I mean, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I don't know if you're like me. I hope not. But uh, I have never been looking for more rules. Getting more rules usually means more hassles and usually means, uh, at least in my case, more guilt. And I don't need more guilt. Uh, maybe you do, but I don't. I mean, I know it makes me sound like a, a rebel, but I don't long for situations where I get a whole new pile of strict guidelines I have to follow. And yet that's pretty much what these people are signing up for at Sinai. And they seem to be gung-ho for it, at least at the start. Now, they get Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is actually not so many. Ten is a good number. It's big enough to be challenging, but small enough to be remembered and to, you know, fit on a plaque at the courthouse or if you're at Nate, in Nate's backyard, um, or to be counted off on ten fingers or if you prefer ten toes. But I must say that this short list has generated a mountain of literature. Uh, much of it trying to wrap our minds around what each commandment actually meant. Like when it says no murdering, does that mean no war? Does it mean no capital punishment? Um, but maybe even more important, trying to figure out why they were given and how they apply to us even today. So I want to answer four questions about these commandments. We could profitably spend our whole time on any one of them, but three of them are not in high dispute in this room, I don't think. So I will hustle through the first three so that I can spend time on the last one where I guess we probably should do some uh, sweaty arm wrestling. I will, it's going to involve the question of grace and liberty. Uh, and so if we're not under the law because we are declared righteous by faith alone, the question remains, what place does obedience have in our lives? Um, and then why do we feel like we're carrying a burden when supposedly all our burden was laid on Christ? Is it possible to be thoroughly saved? And then, like so many people that I know that seem to be followers of that Christ who thoroughly saved them, still spend their days feeling condemned, like they're not measuring up, like uh, they're under a, a cloud of some kind. And maybe you don't churn over questions like that, like I do, but that's kind of where we're headed this morning, and I hope it will be good news for law addicts. It's a major theme of the New Testament. The first question is about the law and salvation. And I don't think any of you are confused on this, but you can go to any American neighborhood and hear stuff like, well, if you live by the Ten Commandments, you pretty much go to heaven, right? Now, I don't mean keep, they, they don't mean keep them perfectly, but almost everyone is going to cuss once in a while or, you know, covet their neighbor's new sports car. But look, if you keep most of the Big Ten most of the time, uh, you're going to get a pass into heaven, sort of like being awarded TSA pre-check at airport security. Don't even have to take your shoes off. So just be a nice American. It's, you know, don't shoot anybody and you're good to go. And it's not that hard. Most people are good enough without half trying. Heaven is for Americans. <laughs> Hell is for, oh, Hitler, Charles Manson, IRS auditors, and cats named Judas. And maybe a few other cats too, but anyway. Well, this is a basic question for anyone reading Exodus 20. Can obeying the law save you? Is keeping the law the way people got saved? And particularly, we're going to ask it this way, before the cross. 
Uh, is this why God was giving the law? Because there was no Jesus yet, so there had to be some way to God. And if you grew up like I did in Sunday school, confused on this, you thought, well, in the Old Testament, that's how they got saved. They kept the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, we don't do that anymore. We just come by faith to Jesus, and uh, we get saved by faith alone. Well, maybe we ought to read the commandments first. These are things God spoke directly to his people from the smoking mountain after the deafening trumpet blast. And so we're going to start on Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spake, or spoke, spake, that would be uh, King James. God spoke all these words, and the words would be sayings. And there were ten of them, not called commands here, but words, and therefore called the Decalogue. Deca means ten, and log means word. Ten words, which became the national constitution of Israel. Saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then comes command number one. That's the uh, preamble. You, and this is singular by the way, referring to God's people collectively, but to be practiced also individually, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I'm not going to go to another God. That's, uh, that's like a, a violation of a, like a marriage covenant. I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. By the way, this is not uh, punishment on the other generations. It's that they all hate him. And so this is uh, the effect that one generation can have on others. But he says, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those, look at the vast numerical contrast, thousands of those, thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Command number three. Could need to do that. There we go. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Commandment four, remember the Sabbath day. Saturday is literally the stopping day. That's what that means, Sabbath, to keep it holy. The Sabbath was first introduced, of course, to Israel in chapter 16 when the manna arrived. Uh, We're told later that the Sabbath was a special sign of this covenant with Israel uh, in chapter 31, just as the rainbow was a sign of which covenant? The one with Noah, right? And circumcision was the sign of the covenant with Abraham. So verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now this, with all of the commandments, really is a provision for a blessed nation so that they could prosper in the land. And so when the people substantially violate these stipulations, it will be subject to the curses of this treaty that are listed in detail in Deuteronomy, including like oppression from foreign armies or uh, taken into exile as a nation. And so individuals such as Daniel who were personally faithful, yet were nevertheless deported to Babylon as the whole nation was being punished. So you see these commandments have this national flavor to them. So with the rest of the commands, they have to do with how Israelites treat each other in this new nation that God has formed, which he is taking into this new land. So the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, that's lying. You shall not covet. The last commandment, craving what belongs exclusively to someone else, this is a a sin of attitude or of thought. And really, you can go back to all the commandments and see that they all have an internal element. Jesus made this so clear from the Sermon on the Mount. And so it says, God said, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Not as we would add a car in there or something like that, because we don't normally have donkeys. Now, I don't have to be very humble to admit that I have broken a large number of these commands. I don't have to be humble to do that, because most of you have done the same. I have probably broken most of them on a single day. 
So to me, it's very comforting to find out that these commandments that I keep breaking were in, never intended to save anyone. Never. If they had been, no one would ever have been saved because no one could keep them except Jesus. So salvation has to be by grace, even in the Old Testament. So let's put this in the form of announcement. I've got four of these announcements today, and the first one is this. There is nothing anyone in any era can do to save themselves from God's wrath. If it's up to you, it won't happen. You can't get out of it. Therefore, salvation will have to come apart from any good works. Now, you don't need to go to Paul or someone like that to prove this. This is perfectly consistent with what Exodus itself teaches or implies. There is an order that must never be reversed. I want you to look how the preamble to this uh, treaty, this uh, covenant, uh, began. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Past tense, brought you already before you obeyed or even I gave any of these commandments. Now, you can't, you can't be messing with this order. Obedience to the law never precedes redemption. I think that's a principle we learn from all of this. Redemption always comes before obedience. Sinai came after they crossed over and were completely free from Egypt. They hadn't done one good thing to persuade God to free them or to love them. In fact, all the good things that God did for them on the way to Sinai were also completely by grace. God gave them water. God gave them food. God gave them protection. Not because of how well they were acting, but in spite of how poorly they were acting. And he just chose to love them that way. And so for 19 chapters, God has been proving his love for them while they were obviously still sinners. And now he will test them to see if they will love him back. He will tell them how to do that. So even in the Old Testament, the law was never a way to get saved. It was for a people who already were. I won't say every individual, but them as a nation. We're learning a pattern of God, how he operates in terms of grace and law. Paul put it like this to the Galatians. If a law could have been given that would give life, um, which would have been great because that would save Jesus from having to go to the cross. But if a law could have been given that would give life, then a righteous standing with God would indeed be by the law. And that was impossible because of the inability and the stubbornness of fallen people. There is no salvation in law law land. But now we need to zero in on a second question. That's an obvious follow-up. If the law couldn't save anyone and didn't need to save anyone because they were already going to be saved by divine grace, then why the law at all? Why did God give the Ten Commandments to Israel? It's the question of the law and the sinner. The next verses start to open our eyes to one of the reasons God gave the law. Look at verse 18. Now, when all the people saw, and which means noticed or experienced because you can't really see thunder, but anyway, they saw, they noticed the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the, mount, <coughs> excuse me, the mountain smoking. The people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off, even farther than what they had been told, and said to Moses, you, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Now you have to wonder if that was the very effect God wanted. Was he trying to scare them? Well, I don't think so. And that would be the wrong kind of fear. That's, that's why Moses responds with this. Moses said to the people, do not fear. That was my clue. All right? He says, do not fear. So you don't have to have that kind of fear. For God has come to test you that the fear of him, well, wait a minute. There must be a good kind of fear too. So let's put this all together. For God has come to test you. That is, to dis he wants to bring out or display where your hearts really are. You people who declare so heartily that you're going to do everything that God says, that the fear of him, this would be the right kind of fear, may be before you that you may not sin. Now, there was and is a good kind of fear that holds sin back based on two things, and you have to have both of these. First of all, it is based on a knowledge of the absolute terrifying greatness of God. But if you just stop there, it won't be the right kind of fear. It is secondly based on the realization that the God who could justly kill you in an instant, in this case of them, has instead chosen to approach them in mercy. That should make anybody tremble. Not because God might kill you, but because he won't, even though he could. 
Grace has taught my heart to fear, we sing. And that should motivate them to obey the commandments and to not sin, Moses tells them. Now, there will be punishments later at times when they disobey that do involve God killing people. But in this case, God is telling them, I don't want you to sin, so I want you to take me seriously. But I have come to you. Now, God accommodates their reflexive fears. He's going to pull back from them and only speak through Moses. But their improper fear was based on their failure to hear the comforting notes of grace in that trumpet call, the one that summoned them to the mountain. That trumpet was a call to come near and hear, and as near as they could, and hear the voice of their divine suitor. This awesome display. I mean, it should not have scared them. I mean, they had seen a robust God at work in power and grace, saving them from Egypt. You remember how the awesome plagues came, but they fell on others. It didn't fall on them. It freed them. So the fireworks of Sinai should have dazzled them, not scared them. This was God coming as near to them as he dared without killing them. And later he will have them build a tent for him so that he can live right in the middle of their camp. He wants to be near them. He finally will come near them in the person of his son to tabernacle among them where they can see his glory full of grace and truth and not die. But from this on, day on, God will speak only to and through Moses. And also from that time on, the people will be flunking this test. Even when the son comes, he comes to his own, and his own receive him not. And so it says in verse 21, the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So let me begin by saying that God gave the law to test the genuineness of those who pledged allegiance to him, and the Jews failed this test over and over. In fact, there are 1,400 plus years of failure proved, provided proof to the whole world that human sin runs so deep in the human heart that even a privileged nation like they were that received the clear, unmistakable oracles of God will still turn aside. And so Paul said it like this in Romans 3, starting in verse 19. This is the great chapter on the universal sinfulness of mankind, you know, where all have sinned and come short of the God, that, that chapter. He says, now we know that whenever the law, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. In other words, it doesn't speak to the, all the Gentiles, it's for the Jews. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. How does that work? Because in this great laboratory God is setting up here, if the Jews fail, then everybody would. And then he says in verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Try to keep the law, you will not find out that you are righteous at your core. You will find out how short you fall. The law declares no one righteous, it declares all men sinners. And it's not because the law is at fault, as if it were weak or bad in some way. It is because we, the people, are weak and bad in every way. And Paul makes this point in several places that I'll, I'll leave to your own research. There's a lot of verses on this, such as Romans 4, 15, for the law brings wrath. It damns you. I mean, it can show your flaws to you, you know, like a good mirror, but it can't do anything to fix them. If you see a flaw in a mirror, you don't grab the mirror off the wall and try to scrub it off. Or as D.L. Moody said, law tells me how crooked I am. It, it takes grace to come along and straighten me out. So let me say it like this. This is another announcement. The law was intended to show the need of a savior. Write down savior. The law was intended to show the need of a savior. As Paul taught in Galatians 3, let's put this up here. The law became our tutor, our guardian to bring us, lead us to Christ. The law kills you so the Savior can make you live. Through the law was the knowledge of sin. So, in fact, the law provided the occasion for sin to actually induce people to sin even more. As Paul teaches in Romans 7, that's how perverse we are. And every mother knows all about it. If she wants something done, she can do it herself. Or she can hire someone to do it. Or she can forbid her kids to do it. All right. Question number three. A third question deserves far more treatment than I can give this morning. It's the question of the law and the gospel. Do people like us who are Christians have to keep the Ten Commandments, including Sabbath? And also then, what about the other 601 Old Testament commandments that provide detail 
how the Israelites were supposed to worship and work and eat and farm and treat their slaves and consecrate festivals and cleanse lepers, etc., 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 etc. Now, trying to answer this gets tricky, and there are lots of debates about this. You know, I'm pretty certain that if you, if you tried to live by all these commands and did so for the right reasons, you would not be offending God. The law was good and right and a blessing for God's people. But unfortunately, it was also a burden. Recall the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. The apostles gathered. They wrestled how much of the law, if any, a saved Gentile had to keep. Did they have to be circumcised? What did they have to do? Well, they ended up ruling that Gentiles should be free from everything in the law except for four things that would tend to repulse devout Jews in their communities. I won't read that all, all that, of that part. Like one of them was, don't eat animals that have been strangled. But it was a matter of testimony and harmony, not conscience. But before they reached this ruling, Peter stood up and he argued against those that were insisting that Gentiles had to keep the whole law, including being circumcised, basically become a Jew. And he asked this, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples, meaning those new Gentile converts, that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? And Peter's words prevail along with other discussion. So in their ruling, they include just those four offensive things and they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you Gentiles no greater burden than these requirements. Now that should answer the question once for all. Except that some will argue that the moral core, the core of the law is still in effect, the Big Ten. Well, maybe not the little laws, you know, the ceremonial and cleanness things and the minutiae of the civil and ceremonial codes. But it's still absolutely wrong to lie, to steal, to murder, to practice idolatry, etc., even after the coming of Christ and the cross of our Lord. Well, it's hard to argue against that. I mean, the answer may especially be be appealing that all the law of the, the moral law, the ten, the ten Commandments should be obeyed if you believe that the church of today is really a replacement for the Israel of the Old Testament. The Jews, of course, rejected and crucified their Messiah and therefore perhaps all their promises and all their regulations have transferred to those who bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I would rather say something like this, and this is, this is a debate, I'm not saying you've got to all believe this, but... I would rather say simply that we ought to avoid lying and stealing, not because those morals are included in the law, but that those morals were in the law because they were always true. And that is, they are repeated in the New Testament, and that's how we know that. Now, only one of the Ten Commandments is not repeated, and that is the law about Sabbath keeping, which was, after all, the special sign of the Mosaic Covenant. That's really, it's just the Sabbath that is in question, and that's part of the debate. So if you're a Gentile, the Decalogue, the ten words, does not apply to you. It never has. It was not your ancestors who ratified such a covenant with God at a holy mountain, so you can eat bacon every day with a clear conscience. And you can work on Saturday, the Sabbath, if you want to. Or you can choose to set aside a day, any day of the week, for rest in that is your freedom, and it may be wise to do that, but it is not required. You don't keep even the moral commandments because they come from Sinai, but because they come through the teachings of Christ and his apostles. And by the way, just because the Old Testament laws never applied to us does not mean they have no value in teaching us about God. Now, let's say that you've got a neighbor who has kids you can learn a lot about that parent by observing the rules and the consequences that he or she has set up for their children. You look at that and you learn a lot about them. You don't have to obey those rules. You do not have to endure those painful spankings. <laughs> but those things will help you understand your neighbor. You understand what I'm saying? So will you keep your eyes open as we work our way through Exodus for those glimpses of God? Will we find out what he's like and the kinds of things that he would do with those children? But yet, there's something deeper than all that, and it's the gospel. Through Christ, even a Jew is released from any obligation to keep the law or ever endure its punishments. Why? Here's the third announcement. The law was fulfilled and superseded by Christ, who both obeyed all the commandments and suffered the full penalty for our failures. And this is why we don't need to pick and choose which Old Testament laws that we're on the hook for. We're on the hook for none of them. 
And why not? Because our Savior lived that life. He fulfilled that law through his obedience, his righteous life, born under the law so he could redeem those who were under the law, Galatians 4. He became a curse for the sake of those the law had cursed. And so we're talking about the cross. And that's where he, although a sinless lamb, became sin for us, Paul says, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.22. All his righteousness is now imputed to us or put on our account. And this is how Jesus fulfilled the law. This is why we are free from it. So this is another comforting thing. I can share this about the Ten Commandments. They don't have jurisdiction over you. Don't obey the Ten Commandments. Don't just quote me in those, just that word. Don't obey the Ten Commandments. You have already done that in Christ. Don't fear being punished for not keeping them. All possible penalties have already been suffered by our Savior in our place. The law says do, but the gospel says done. When God looks at you, he sees you completely righteous in Christ as if you had kept every law every day of your life, ten for ten. But now we come to the wrestling match. The law and liberty. Now, if we are freed from the law by the work of Christ, are we then free to be as unholy as we want to be? Because he did all the obeying, then we're off the hook for all of that. Well, question four is this. Where does obedience fit into a justified solely by faith life? There are whole books of the New Testament written about that. And that's why I know it's so important to get this right. When I knew I was teaching on the Ten Commandments, I needed to figure out how this chapter in Exodus really matters to us. And in a congregation like this, I don't think we have many who think that we have been saved to live a lawless, disobedient, ungodly life. We call those antinomians. Now, such people have the opposite issue from what Nate was talking about last week. Not how to have morality with God, but how to have God without morality. But I don't think we have... A lot of those in our church, or they probably wouldn't stay around. Uh, But there is a problem we tend to face in a congregation like ours, where we are serious about following a holy Christ. I believe it's possible many of us, including me, have a confused and sloppy idea of how obedience works alongside grace, and that is what I want to talk about today. I want us to leave here with a better grip on what the obedient life is about, and I want us to avoid what I'm calling law addiction. I'm going to identify what it means to be a, what I call a decaholic and how to deal with it. But in order to get to that, I want to make a, another announcement. This is the fourth one. Obedience to New Testament commands is the free and loving outflow of a grateful heart and evidence of regeneration and faith. It's not a have to, it's a get to. Now, we all know that there are lots of commandments in the New Testament that we're supposed to take seriously like forgiving one another, or, you know, if you have church leaders, they should have certain qualifications. We know we shouldn't gossip, we should not take revenge, we should strip off all anger and lying and lust, and we all believe that those are non-negotiable, that they are not just when you feel like it, like mere suggestions. And so there are lots of those New Testament commands. Uh, In my Bible reading this week, I counted more than 30 commands just in that little small, that small letter called Colossians. There's a lot to be responsible for. Even when we're not on the hook for 600 plus Old Testament commandments, we are followers of Christ, and He is our God and Master, and He has given us our New Testament, and we take it seriously. This is what we must do. We were bought with a price. Our life is His. Now, there's, however, a dynamic difference between being under law and being under grace. Obedience is the free and loving outflow. Let's take each of those words. It is free meaning it's not under compulsion, but from a willing heart. In other words, no threat of death here. You know, I do the, if I do it wrong, then God's going to kill me. It's not like that. So it's free, and it's loving. It's obedience is loving God back. He first loved us. It honors Christ's word, where he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It also means we love our neighbors. This is the law of love. It is a free and loving outflow. And that is a huge word here. Obedience is the inevitable result of a new life, maybe even more like an overflow. It's it's how the life you have been given expresses itself. It's like its heartbeat, something that starts very internal, not just external box checking. It is the evidence, then, of a grateful heart. 
knowing that there's nothing, the outflow of a grateful heart means that you know there's nothing you deserve here. You don't deserve this life with God. You are thrilled to receive God's kindness and you want to give back whatever you can in all humility. Even if it's just obeying what he said. This is all response to what God initiated by grace. And so your obedience is not the root of your salvation. You know that. But it is its fruit. And so it is an inevitable evidence of new life that comes by spiritual regeneration. That's new birth. Obedience is an evidence of faith. That is real faith will always involve God honoring attitudes and actions. And you know that from like from James. Faith without works is dead, is worthless. Or as Paul puts it in the Great Emancipation Proclamation, the book of Galatians, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but faith, and then he has these words, working through love. Therefore, our relation to commands involves not a have to, but a get to. You know, God, tell me what pleases you. I want what you want. I have the blood-bought privilege of bringing you glory. I serve not to get something for me, but to be able to worship you. And oh, that we actually believed all that. But we don't. Not well enough. How can I say that? Well, I don't mean to offend you, or, or maybe I do, but, I, <laughs> but here we go. Let me give you some situations that you might have been in or observed, and these are very common. And this might, maybe you never thought about these things. One very common one is uh, someone dies, and we want to know one way or the other whether we will see them again, you know, safe in the arms of Jesus. In our grief, we thumb through our list called evidences of salvation. We will have one of those. Somewhere in our mind, we don't write them down, but hey, this guy was usually in church, so let's see, yeah, two out of four, I don't know, but he always carried a nice Bible. And he went forward at a Billy Graham crusade when he was a young man, and he would never eat without saying grace, as far as I know. And he gave money, and he loved kids, and he paid his bills, and he, you know, he voted. He was easy to get along with. Now, if you evaluate a life in terms like that, no matter how much you want to give the thumbs up to a dearly departed person, you have just reserved yourself a seat right next to me at Decaholics Anonymous. Did you think to wonder if the man's prideful heart had ever been broken before Jesus? Or remember that most of us are pretty expert at faking even that. There's a lot going on here when you think about evidences of someone truly being saved. Is it a list? Another scenario. We judge a neighbor as having no spiritual life because his car is always there when I leave for church and then it's always still there unmoved when I get home. Or here's another one. Someone asks a 20-something woman who grew up in church what a Christian is. And her answers involved a series of behaviors. Uh, a Christian is someone who prayed a prayer, doesn't swear, doesn't do drugs. She gets forgiveness by being sincerely sorry and doing better next time. She believes in herself and is nice to everybody and doesn't hang around with bad people. It's a true story. If that's the answer we're getting, then we probably have someone who will walk away from Jesus because they never met the real one. This is moralism. This is self-effort. It's not anywhere close to the grace of Christ in the gospel. If this person stays in church, they're going to be very hardworking and burdened down with keeping themselves saved. Someone confronts you about some Christian thing that you're not doing very well. Uh, Donald Miller writes about how he used to say he believed it was important to tell people about Jesus, but he never did it. His friend Andrew very kindly pointed that out, and he said, if you if you don't introduce people to Jesus, then evidently you don't believe Jesus is an important person. What didn't matter, what Donald said, is actions advertise his real beliefs. Now, of course, you should care about introducing people to Jesus. So let's say Donald starts trying harder to do just that. But let's say he does so because he's embarrassed to think that he doesn't believe Jesus is important and that working harder at evangelism might provide some evidence that he's a better Christian than his friend Andrew thought. So he starts by fixing his actions. But now look, there is a vast difference between that and witnessing because he actually thinks and knows Jesus is important. The thing to work on initially is not witnessing more, but finding out how important Jesus is. 
and truly believing in him. And then internal consistency urges you to be wanting to talk to him or about him to other people, pretty much automatically. Wasn't that really Andrew's point? Gospel fluency. Now we could construct similar scenarios where, you know, like whether you believe people are, really believe people are lost. And that is an expression of hatred to not tell someone that they're going to be judged in hell without Jesus. So where do you go to fix yourself on that? You start telling more people they're going to hell? <laughs> or actually start examining why you don't love people the way God loves you? Or if someone tells you it's a mark of pride when you don't pray. And so you repent of not praying rather than repenting of the pride and of feigning the delusion that your life could go okay without any of God's help. Or you don't read your Bible enough. And so you must not realize this is the very voice of God that you need in order to live and grow. And so you legalistically try to read your Bible more without ever examining why you were reading it without hearing God. Are you getting me? Is this exposing anything in you like it is in me? You get troubled about your soul and whether your life bears real evidence that your faith is real, that you really are a Christian. You aren't really proud of the way you live all the time, but it, you're trying hard. But, you know, you don't pray enough, you don't give enough, you don't attend church enough, you don't read your Bible enough, and you hear what Spurgeon once said to his congregation, there's enough dust on some of your Bibles to write the word damnation. <laughs> but you watch bad movies sometimes and you blow up at your kids or your spouse and you don't call your mom as often as you should and 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 but I ask says who who decided you don't pray enough I mean okay your mom said you didn't call enough she is the expert on that but the rest of it who decided you don't read your Bible enough you are dogged by guilt and every time you come to the Lord's Supper let's say you have a lot of confessing to do and you wonder if you should just refrain, just be honest, and you find yourself asking, hey, if I'm a real Christian, how come I'm so bad at it? So you work harder. And here's what's going on with that. You have constructed a law-based life. You may, in fact, be a law addict. They're way too common among serious believers. Now, I'm measuring myself by the law, some law, but not by grace. There is no good answer to whether you have enough proof from your behavior that you're a good enough Christian because the Bible doesn't give you one. It doesn't measure a life by a list. In honest circumstances, a list will always tell you you are not a good enough person. Unless you play mind games with it, then you can, it'll tell you you're fine. Now, maybe you're simply trying to prove to yourself that you're a Christian because you've heard from someone important named Jesus. By their fruits, you will know them. And so there ought to be some evidence of life change once you have met Christ. Okay. And so you come to the holy mountain and you walk away with heavy tablets that accuse or defend you, but not really laws of God's choosing, but of yours, and maybe mostly from the Bible, but partly from the community of Christians around you who have their pet expectations of what faith looks like. But these are usually external things. So like the church that fired a pastor because he smoked a cigarette when for years he had been prideful and unforgiving. But it doesn't really matter where the list comes from or how well you keep it or don't. Living by list does not come from the God of the cross. And that's a big and concerning problem. Why? Because your list doesn't count. And it's just bondage. And your laws are like a human ruler that is not a good measure of reality. You can make a short little ruler. That'll make you look taller, easier rules that you can do. According to this little ruler that I made, I'm almost eight feet tall, almost a spiritual giant. <laughs> and so what if you do or you don't measure up, really? Your rules are almost always external things that you can count that don't really require a changed or changing heart. They can burden you. They can defeat you. Or worse yet, they can make you proud of yourself and judgmental toward anyone who doesn't rise up to your superior level of addiction. And why is it worse yet? Because it's so much harder to repent of your good deeds. Now, sometimes people in your faith community will make you feel judged. They are so good at the Christian thing. <laughs> so you try to hide your failings because you want everyone to think you're good, that you're the real deal, and inside you know better. Uh, and you know you're not that nice. 
You forget to wonder if they all feel the same way about themselves, and they hide too. Nobody is as nice as they seem, but you wonder if you're just a fake, that maybe the changes you have made are you changing you, not God at work in a broken and worthy sinner. Maybe it's really not God making you like Jesus. It's just you wearing a Jesus costume. And it's so frustrating and it's so tiring trying to play perfect when you're not. Your one consolation is that you seem to care about being the real thing. Enough at least to fake it. You want what I want for you and for me to be a real Christian, to really know God. But I will tell you with all that is in me, you never get that from the law. You can tell yourself over and over to stop fretting over your relationship with God. After all, you prayed a prayer back in 2006 and you got baptized and you made cinnamon rolls for the Dunes Youth Retreat for crying out loud. But in the end, you should be wailing with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And if your life is changing, that's wonderful. But if your main source of relief from fear of rejection is anything but the blood of Christ, you are in great need of the gospel. Your personal obedience adds absolutely nothing to your acceptance before God. Nothing. It could make you feel better, but if you are thinking for one second that when God sees you, he will be looking for any of that, and not whether you are clothed in Christ's righteousness, you are legalistically confused and in some level of bondage. Christ wants you to be free. I've shared several evidences of someone possibly struggling with law addiction. And as with all, all addictions, the thing that we have gone to to give us happiness or whatever ends up enslaving us. This particular addiction comes from faith negating fear. Try, try to think th through this with me. Your attraction to law is possibly because, this wouldn't be a conscious thing I don't think exactly, but possibly because you're scared that the mind and grace of God can't really be depended on. I mean, I have to know where I stand, and so I need to be in control of that. So I must erect some way to control or stabilize eternal outcomes in order to finally relax and know I'm okay, so I want a list. But how do I really know when I've done enough? You know, my perfect attendance pin from my old church, how many cinnamon rolls I actually baked? You know, that's the dilemma of all false religion. You never know if you've done enough. So you measure yourself by the little ruler you made for yourself or that someone sold you for the price of your soul. The law brings nothing but condemnation. Real faith is a surrender to the control of God, to be at his mercy as an unworthy sinner, a John 1.13 sinner who becomes a child of God, not by bloodlines or the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but born of God. Jesus invites you, your weary soul to come to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, give you, not pay you, something you earned, I will give you rest. Just come. Take my yoke, not the yoke of the law, but the yoke of grace on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is what I want for us. There's nothing here about measuring up and then you get to rest. Just go to Jesus, learn from him, learn his heart, how to rest in a finished work. Paul said it like this in Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Be like Paul. I mean, he, he took all that he gained by keeping laws. He was a you know, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he threw all of that self-admiration and stuff into the dumpster because he just wanted Christ. He knew he couldn't have both, the smug satisfaction of self-effort and the majestic accomplishment of Christ, who suffered and rose again. And so this is what he wrote, oh, to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, his quest 
was not even to know he was a Christian. This is how he wrote it right after that. He says that I might know him. Him, not, not me, not me and how wonderful I am or how well I have measured up, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that I might know him. So how will it be when you meet God? Will you be content to be found in Christ and just stand there on the merits of his work, not yours? Or will you stand there shaking, hoping that God will see that fat volume of notes you have taken about your life, your good deeds that you've lugged up to heaven, that you, you know, confess your sins up to date and you show all the good evidences of being a Christian and all the, the mission trips you went on and all the care of widows and the fine way that you treated your customers and the humility you showed when you gave all that money to that needy family, you kept it completely anonymous, and, and you will point to all of that as a little bit of evidence that you're one of those people who really belongs in heaven, in God's presence. Will, will you do that? Pleading how good you have been? No. No. You will immediately know that you are unworthy at the very core of your being. And the Father will be actually beaming at you as he looks over at the sun to make sure that the sun knows you. And that's all that will matter. Because if Jesus doesn't know you, you can insist until you are blue in your face that you did so many wonderful things in his name, but it will not matter one bit. Jesus said it like this, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And made many mighty cinnamon rolls in your name. And then I will declare to you, to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew 7. Knew you. As in chose you. Died for your sins. Shed his blood for you. Now I kind of close a message on Exodus 20 without reading from Hebrews 12. Where the preacher thinks back on what the Israelites and Moses went through at Sinai and contrasts it with what we as Christians have as the Lord's people in this very room. And it is a contrast between two mountains, a mountain of fear and a mountain of festive joy. So he starts with Sinai. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, that would be us, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And now here's the climax of this lesson. It's not a trembling Moses, the mediator of a law covenant, but to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, the blood of the cross, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel, why in the world did he put that right in the end? Well, this is huge because you remember Cain killed Abel and then Abel's blood cried out for vengeance on his murderer. And the blood of Jesus carries, he says, a far better message, a demand not for justice on the sinner, even vengeance on Christ's murderers. You remember he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Huh. His blood demands forgiveness on the sinner. His blood cries out for mercy on the unworthy. And you come to this mediator with joy and with freedom because God is satisfied by the sacrifice of Christ's blood for you and you need no other standing than that. Your hope is built on nothing less. Your hope is built on nothing more. Your faith is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And that's why all the preeminence belongs to Jesus and all the glory goes to God, not to us. Every sin that you ever did was paid in full by Him. And every good you ever did is a credit to His grace, to His strength, because without Him, you could do nothing. There is no credit to you 
for keeping a single command, not even one, and you will know it. And you will be glad that he didn't let you go on sinning continually and by that rob him of the glory he deserved by the living of your one paltry life, a life that he cherishes as a masterpiece of his grace. Ephesians 2.10. And in his presence, true, you're going to take your place among the greats as if you were being inducted into the hall of fame and you be sitting there with the Ty Cobbs and the Babe Ruths and you pinch yourself, wonder how you got there, and then you'll remember it's all because of Jesus and his blood. It's not based on your great string of home runs, but it's just Jesus. And you see that that's certainly true because there's an old lady sitting right in front of Mantle and Griffey who just kept praying secretly for a Sunday school class, and she was the real McCoy, looking for all the world like she's the queen who couldn't possibly wear a crown more nobly. And you see, she's doing what you're doing, just looking for the king. You know with all your heart that this is why you ever lived, why you existed, why you were so restless until you found your rest in the love of the Lamb who died for you. And in he comes to the sound of a million trumpets and unending songs of praise and everyone's looking around at each other like, wow, what could be better than this? Sometimes it causes me to tremble. And what was I ever thinking when I thought I needed to come with some little merit of my own and impress someone that I belong there? I don't belong here. I'm only here because he belongs here. And so here is the lamb, and he's being worshipped as a lion of power, and nothing in all creation could be better than this, even though it will not include one word of praise for you or me for what we did with our pathetic list of laws. Revelation 5. The lion, the lamb, enters glory, and this is what everyone sings. Close your eyes as you think of this scene. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And there is no second verse that will celebrate all the good things about wonderful you, because through all eternity they will never finish the first one, singing about him. And so just come to him. Pull up a nice chair, sit down, and enjoy the rest. Let's pray. While, Lord, we could come to you and just say, thanks, we're going to worship you. We're going to remind ourselves that it's because of him. You are a blessed son whom you've always wanted to honor. And so we honor him. Some of us maybe need to write down a, you know, the confessions of a law addict. Give up those games of making lists and trying to measure up. We need to obey you, but we want it to be the fresh, real outflow of grateful hearts, eager to bring glory to you by how we live, to bring attention to you, not to us. We're not very good at this, so help us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.